Welcome to the Big Money Questions show. I'm Rachel Rickard Strauss, personal finance editor for This Is Money. Today we're talking about the tricks that retailers play on us to encourage us to spend money and how we can immunize ourselves against them. We have Mark Ventino Creevy with us. He's a professional a professor of organizational behavior at the Open University Business School. Um, and he's also an expert in the psychology um, of financial behavior. Uh, so pretty well placed to talk us through these sorts of tricks and how we can protect ourselves against them. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to ask you first of all, what type of tricks do do retailers play? I, well, I think the first thing to understand is that it's not our thinking that drives our behaviour mostly. Um, w when we when we act, it's mostly on the basis of emotion. Um, uh, so it's a fundamental of human psychology. Emotions drive behaviour, and. Uh, Advertisers are really good at understanding this and really tapping into the emotional appeal. Mm -hmm. um, regulators and government, and by, the, by and large, think that um, uh, mostly what they should do is give us really good quality information, and, um, ad but advertisers recognise that it's mostly about emotions. And it's interesting because, by and large, government and regulators are pretty pessimistic about their ability to affect human behaviour. Um, advertisers do it on a, a daily basis. So, so give me some examples of the type of kind of emotions that uh, that advertisers will tap into. Oh, well, the full gamut. Uh, so um, it might be emotions of shame. You know, uh, air freshener advertisers are really good at this. You know, the the adverts that subtly suggest that if your home smells of it, uh, then you really you really should be ashamed, and your your children, your uh, neighbours, your family will be rather ashamed of you. Um, it might be um, about um, uh, the desire to keep up with uh, with the people around you. It might be uh, you know, developing a sense of acquisitiveness, uh, emotion of greed. Um, it might be uh, fear. Um, there's um, lots of advertisers. Uh, by the way, politicians are pretty good at this as well. Uh, will play on our emotions of fear. So you know, if, if there's lots of products that you sell on. Uh, the fear of something happening. So various kinds of health products will oft often take that kind of approach. Okay, so we've got fear, um, we've got embarrassment and shame, we've got keeping up with the Joneses. Um, love, actually. Um, lots, of, um, lots of people are motivated to spend money on people they really care about. Um, so there's, uh, you know, especially around Christmas and those kinds of things, you see lots of advertisers putting a lot of effort into getting a warm, loving feeling about family, about children. About, and the idea there is that you, to encourage you to express your love by spending money on them. Do people have different types of buttons that they're sort of um, most susceptible to? Yeah, we're all different. Okay. Um, there, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways of characterising people. One way that um, myself and a colleague, Adrian Furnham, have found very um, useful in our research um, has been a way of characterising people in terms of their attitudes to money and what they see money as for. And we characterise people in four different ways. One where people who see money as love, mm -hmm. money as the giving and uh, receiving of love. Um, there's you know, a lot of generosity bound up in that. We also talk about money as generosity in that category. Um, another is those people who see money as freedom. Uh, if I've got money, it gives me the freedom to do the things I want. You know, lots of holiday kind of adverts will try and tap into those, those things. Or, but you know, a surprisingly wide range of um, categories of product will try and uh, uh, tap into a sense of freedom. You know, it's not, you know, some tampon adverts, for example, mm. seem to do that. Um, money as security. If you're somebody who sees money as mostly about maintaining security, actually, by the way, this is the category of person who's much more likely to do better in their financial affairs and rather less inclined to impulsive spending behaviour. Mm -hmm. If you want to press that button, person and buttons, then um, it's about... Uh, raising uh, anxiety about loss of security, actually. Um, so uh, money is love, uh, money is freedom, money is security. But the fourth category, money is power. Money is power and status, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and for this kind of person, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to emphasise the status um, and, the, and the public signals of status that the, the things they're going to buy will convey. Okay. 
I wonder what we can do to immunise ourselves uh, against these sorts of, of behaviours. Yeah, I think there's, there, there's two things. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that w it, it's great that we're now getting financial education into schools, but mostly it sits in the maths curriculum <laughs> or, or thereabouts, and it's seen as about f imparting facts and um, a, a, a sort of detailed understanding of financial products and how they work and so on. Um, and what it neglects is it neglects the emotional side and, and our emotional relationships to our money are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And actually what I'd love to see on the school curriculum is some of what we're about to do where you encourage children to be able to deconstruct adverts and look at them and say, what is this, what is this advert trying to do to me? Yeah. So that you understand some of the, the, the tricks that uh, adverts use to try and influence your behaviour. Yeah. Because some of it seems fairly obvious, right? Um, uh, but a lot of it is a lot more subtle. And so it's yeah. about reading those kind yeah. of hidden messages and how we're being manipulated. Yeah. There's yeah. not necessarily anything sinister about it. That's their job. But yeah. it also it's ours to understand it. But as an it informed and, citizen, it's a really yeah. important uh, yeah. skill to be able to understand yeah. what it is that, that the retailers are trying to influence you to do and how they're trying to do that. So that's, that's one thing, is mm -hmm. you know, good quality education, helping people understand these things. But the other is uh, that, that comes out of the research that uh, myself and colleagues have done on impulsive buying behaviour is that there's a lot of evidence that impulsive buying behaviour is often driven as a kind of way of managing our emotions and our moods. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that people who've got less good strategies for managing their emotions are the people who are most likely to be impulsive spenders. Um, so the other side of it is helping people develop better strategies for managing their emotions. Um, impulsive buying behaviour is just one of a range of those kinds of responses. So you know, people uh, overeat to manage their mood, they will smoke or drink to manage their mood. Um, impulsive buying is just a, an, another uh, strategy like that that isn't always terribly good for us. Again, our research shows that people who are impulsive buyers are much more likely to get into financial difficulty. So in a sense, it's, it's a matter of looking at the root cause of the impulse buying rather than just sort of defending yourself against it in the moment when you're about to make that purchase. Yeah, th those, th those kinds of strategies don't work. Um, there's lots of evidence they don't work because self-control is like a muscle. It gets exhausted quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of evidence that people who are best at self-control tend to be better at self-control not because they're really, really good at resisting temptation, but they're quite good at having strategies for avoiding temptation. Ah, oh, so that is something that, if you are susceptible to impulse buying, that is something that you can do. Um, I suppose not go shopping or, uh, you know, unsubscribe yourself from those emails that you get from your favourite retailers telling you about the latest flash sales or recognize or by recognizing the times when you're particularly vulnerable to that mm -hmm. you know so it's um there's a number of times when our self-control is at its weakest um when we're feeling emotionally vulnerable um when our blood sugar's low by the way you know so um, actually maybe eat something before you go out shopping yeah. um the uh, the other time is uh, when we've had to exercise our self-control quite a lot um so you've had a bad day at work um you walk by the shops on your way home, uh, you're just that much more likely to give in and purchase something on the spur of the moment. Okay. So particularly if you're tired, going home, hungry, that's when you hop straight on the tube and, you know, walk blinkered past the shops. Yeah, yeah. But these times are also, you know, interestingly, um, buying online has become much more um, of an issue, of course. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, a PhD student of mine, uh, uh, Matthew Shawcross, did some really interesting interviews with people who are self-identified impulsive buyers. Um, and a lot of them said, yeah, I don't do the online thing so much impulsively because there isn't that instant satisfaction of having it in your hands straight away. Mm -hmm. And that's why people like Amazon are putting such great effort into being able to deliver as fast as possible. There's, it's, quite, it's even possible nowadays, if you live in a major city, to get it the same day. That's so uh, interesting. And, that's, mm. uh, and that makes you much more likely to buy impulsively because you get that instant satisfaction, yeah. nearly instant satisfaction. Because so many of the things that you can receive on the same day or next day delivery, 
it doesn't really matter, does it, whether you get it? It really shouldn't matter whether you have it then or, or a week later. But that they've put that much investment into the infrastructure around getting products to us quickly suggests... If yeah, it's a planned so. purchase, that's probably true. Mm-hmm. If, it's, if it's an on the spur of the moment, oh, I'd love that. Yeah. Um, oh, you can't get it till next week. Well, maybe I don't need it so much. It's, you know, so that's what retailers, online retailers are fighting against. Okay. Um, I wonder what we do about that. The same sort of um, practical steps, knowing what your vulnerabilities are. Shopping when you when you know that you're at your strongest and um, uh, yeah. thinking twice. And that's the thing, isn't yeah. it? Uh, many of us sit down and uh, browsing through uh, the in- things on the internet and uh, opportunities to buy. And by the way, you know our social media now is full of adverts that will link straight through to buying opportunities mm-hmm. at times when we're when when our resistance is a bit low. And what you said about um, creating social norms to make us feel more comfortable about spending, there seems to be a whole kind of infrastructure around that as well in terms of uh, debt and yeah, interest-free. Yeah, and yeah. so um, if you're a retailer and you want to get people to buy impulsively, and that, that, that's certainly a way of increasing your total take, you know, you actually get people to buy more not uh, rather than sort of just fighting against getting a bigger share in a zero-sum game, taking a share away from your competitors. Um, If you want to get people to buy impulsively, you have to try and dismantle as many of the barriers as possible. And one barrier is that um, there's there's kind of a social norm that just buying things on the spur of the moment, that's not a great thing to do. So some retailers put a great deal of effort into trying to dismantle those social norms. So L'Oreal, for example, have got a long... uh, record of this strap line that they worked at for years and years and years. You're worth it. The whole point of that is because you're worth it. It's about self-esteem. It's not a bad thing to do. It's really about dismantling that social norm that just buying yourself something that's a bit of a luxury is is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, other uh, retailers will work on um, uh, trying to reinforce particular kinds of social norms or help you believe that there's a social norm that pushes you in the direction of buying uh, their uh, products. So a really good example of that is the, um, the Glade adverts will often play on a sort of tacit sense of shame about maybe your house smells or there's this great little advert where little boy wants to do a poo. I want to do a poo. Come on, then. But I want to do a poo in Paul's bathroom. Don't be silly. Come on. I'm going to do a poo at Paul. Turns out that uh, Paul's toilet has an air, uh, has a um, an air freshener in it, and that it, it's never actually said, but the tacit message is, "Mum, your toilet smells, and your little boy's ashamed of you." And uh, and it's a very powerful message. That's very powerful and so manipulative. Yeah, and, and so manipulative, exactly. And, and exactly. it's incredible to have shifted a social norm so far for something to be something so yeah. normal yeah. to being I mean, you see, it's a flat for backfire. You know, you look yeah. at some of the chat online about that particular ad, but there are some people who think it's a charming little boy and, and feel pulled yeah. in. Others say, I just want to slap him. <laughs> it's, it's, um, the... Um, The the other kind of um, thing that retailers are fighting against a lot at the moment is this, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk. I mean, to some extent, I think you have to take this talk about Generation X and Millennials and so on with a pinch of salt because any any wide generalisation you make turns out to be not that useful. But nonetheless, there's there's a sense in the retail world that Millennials are much more interested in in meaning in life as opposed mm-hmm. to having stuff. Yeah. So there's a lot of adverts are starting to focus on saying, well, buy this stuff because it's about the meaning in your life. Okay. And a, a really good example of that is Talk Talk. Uh, Talk Talk uh, for if they're if you're selling lots of broadband and you want people to use the internet lots and lots, one of the things you're fighting against is the narrative that's out there in the press in other places about the internet's destroying family life and it's putting us into our mm. little boxes. So what they do in their advert is that it's really very clever. What they do is they show um, a whole series actually both uh, 
on YouTube and on the telly of ordinary families doing ordinary things together. But the focus of the adverts is that they're being a family and they're doing stuff together around their devices, whether it's around the TV, whether it's a, a laughing together over a, um, a, an iPad or some other device or, uh, or sitting around and doing things that are... Mm -hmm. that, together as a family that are mediated by their access to the internet. And it's about saying, actually, accessing the internet, and through Talk Talk particular, in particular, it's about that sort of really meaningful family interaction. So it brings families together, without which they'd be sitting in their own re rooms reading books, presumably. But because <laughs> they've all got the internet, they can sit round and share things on their phones with each other and... So, but, but the thing is, it's only sketched out, this story. It's about the emotional sense of this very broad brush. Because any real storyteller, and frankly any scam artist as well, knows something really important about human psychology is you want to persuade someone of something, they're your best ally in persuading uh, them. Because if you can motivate them emotionally to want to believe the story, you can just draw it with broad brush and they'll fill in the detail for themselves. Uh, you don't need to fill in all the detail. In fact, the more you fill in the detail, it's less likely that they'll buy it. Okay, know? because um, it becomes less true to them, whereas if you leave it broad yeah. strokes, they fill in with yeah. detail that is pertinent to themselves and so they believe it. Yeah, more. so whether it's, um, it, it's the internet helps, helps you have a warm feeling about your family mm -hmm. or um, we'll give 350 million a week to the NHS, you don't need the detail in there. Yeah, okay. You just need the message, a rough story, and people will do the rest for you. Yeah. If you've got the right sort of story. Yeah. Gosh. Okay. Um, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a lot to think about and a lot more to learn about blinkering yourself um, at times when you know that you're most vulnerable to, to impulse shopping, I suppose. Um, thank you so much and thank you for joining us on the Big Money Questions. You're very welcome.